addition to be able to support more weight to get through the whole workout. Because you're not going to get through any of these phases. You're not going to get through a volume training in less than, let, I'd say, maybe an hour. And that's if you're working out with one person. Volume with three to four people, each session is probably going to take you at least two hours. And you need that downtime. You need to be able to come in at each set, each rep, give it a, going 100 miles per hour, give it everything you have. Okay, because each set, you got to forget what you did the last one as far as, oh, I'm tired because that's why you got to come in fresh. You got to walk around, get some air, get some water. You got to come back fresh because every time you hit that, you hit that platform, you hit that bench, it's got to feel like a competition. And that's, that's just how I train. If I'm coming in, if I'm doing uh, my first set is going to be 10, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do the best 10 I can. I'm going to take some time off, then I'm going to do the 10. You can't think about holding back because you have, you're only on set one of four and you're doing 20. You can't set, hold back because you still, got, you still got to save. You cannot save energy. That's what you have people there for. That's why you always have to have spotters because part of volume is this fatigue. There's going to come a point, it doesn't matter how strong you are, whether it's 225 or whether it's 600 pounds on the bar, anything, if you slip the wrong way, can crush you, you can tear something. That's why I think in a lot of the videos and a lot of stuff you'll see, I'll always have spotters. And this is something we don't, and I don't necessarily care so much about the criticism, but when you see the four, the five, the 600 pounds, you know, for four, 600 pounds for five reps or 675 for one, the thing that you don't see is you don't see the whole two hour of footage before it went in to get it to that point. You don't know that we've already done 20 sets and 400 reps. So at any point when you're that fatigued with that kind of weight above your head, all it takes is one slip and your career is done. And it's not, it's not worth it. That's why I can't stress enough that a lot of the stuff you see us do, we're going to have spotters, we're going to have hands on the bar, we're going to have elbow wraps because it is training. Now, I, I have a strong belief I will cheat in the gym, I will cheat on the bench, and it's going to help me win on the platform. You cheat during training. Cheat, meaning you'll hear people like CT talk about it. You can't always have super strict form on everything. Sometimes you got to cheat. Sometimes you got to bounce off your chest. Sometimes you need that spotter to help you. I'd rather, I'd rather train for a couple weeks with a spotter helping me with 10 to 20 pounds and know that I'm doing 10 to 20 pounds more than if I was just to train and just do the weight all on my own. Now you're gonna get stronger, but what's the other person doing? What's your competitor doing? Are you outlifting them? And that's something I, I think about constantly. That's why I'll take a spot, you know, because I wanna be able to do the maximum amount of weight because I know that's gonna to translate to more poundage on the bar. It's gonna to translate to more stuff during competition. So after phase one, we're into phase two. Now we're starting to do, we're gonna do more, still gonna do probably sets of 10, but we're gonna break it down into do more compound, more weight. So we might do phase two, week four, five, and six, or five, six, and seven. They might look, a lot of your sets might look something like three by three by 10, you know, which is your first three, then you might do four sets of 20, and then you might end up with five sets of five or five sets of eight. So we're still doing 10 total sets, and when you add it up, we're still trying to stay in that two to 400 range. But now is when you're putting on more weight, and you're able to do more weight, and you're able to do the amount of sets because we went and we made sure we were super strong for 10 by 10. That's why, that's what phase one, phase one gets you ready for phase two. Phase one gets your muscles in shape to do a two hour workout with two to 300 pounds on. Because when you average it out, some, so I look at some of our sets and some of our workouts, we're doing like, I think an average, sometimes like 200 something reps at an average weight of 319. That's what you want to look at. You can multiply everything out. What is your rep average? And so it's like you want to go out there because I'm not a firm believer, even close to a competition, to getting down so you're only doing one or two and you're gearing, you're, you're gearing your muscles down to be able to be strong for one or two. You want to be strong for, I think, seven to ten. And it just happens to be that your muscles are happy and you're rewarding your muscles. When you, if, you're, if, if I'm strong on 600-pound bench, for example, and my, my, the way I look at it, if I'm strong for five to six reps in the gym, when I go to a competition and I only have to lift 600 pounds once, my muscles are over. It's like Christmas for my, I get ecstatic. My, I, that's why a lot of times in competition, I don't feel 
and I think the last couple ones, my opener, whether it's five or 550, feels so much heavier than what I finished with. If you watch the, the footage of um, the LA Fit Expo, to me, I feel like I struggled. And it, it becomes a mind game. I feel like I struggled when I opened with 550. I knew I was doing sets of 650, 675 in the gym. So when I hit the platform and opened with 550, there's part of me that I had, I had doubts. I was like, why does that feel so heavy? And that's kind of sometimes the downfall or maybe the slight drawback or maybe my own personal criticism with the volume is you, you put yourself in a position to do what you need to do because you've done it in the gym. Now you're going to duplicate it on the platform, but you can't get out of the fact that it still feels, it still feels heavy because you're not practicing a lot of one or two rep max. But it comes to anything, whether, whether you're a police officer, whether you do karate, whether you do boxing, you just got to know that you put everything into your training and you got to be able to trust your training. You got to be able to trust that your partners had your best interest, that everybody had your best interest as, as well as yourself. And it just comes into you got to be able to trust your training. And that's just the philosophy you got to take with you anywhere in life. If you put in the hard work, the dedication, and you put in the training, when the competition, when the time comes, you got to be able to trust in that. Because because you cannot over, you can't go in and you can't overthink. You can't think yourself into doing 600 pounds. You can't think yourself into going to an NFL combine and running a 4-1. It's all about training. Now, you're going to have doubts, and that's the butterflies in your stomach. That's just with anything. That's because you never want to go into anything overconfident. You want to have self-doubt because that self-doubt is going to fuel you to put on the best that you can so you don't hold nothing back. So with that being said, you just it comes down to you just got to overtrain. You just got to trust your training. You just got to trust your partners. And you'll get through it. And you'll see a lot of times on the platform, a lot of people have that same, that same kind of mindset where your first one always feels tough. And then your second one, you're like, okay, now, now I'm getting warm. Now it's getting easier. Then your third one, hopefully you get all, all white lights, meaning your lift was good. And then, you know, some meets, you get a fourth, you get a personal, or if it's a strict federation, you would get to go for, you know, like a world record or a state record. Um, so that's that's kind of phase that's phase one and phase two, phase two transitioning it to get ready for phase three, which is phase three is just about power. It's about you want to make sure you're doing you know six to ten sets, maybe ten, fifteen. You still want to maybe you want to go for twenty, and then that's also where you got to start incorporating a lot of speed work because you never want to just train only one phase of it. You don't want to just train your fast twitch muscles. You don't want to just train your slow twitch muscles. So. You see, a lot of times my splits will look like it's something I'll advocate. On Monday, I'll do a heavy AM, and this is phase three and phase two. I'll do a heavy AM. I'll come back, you rested, you know, some good meals, some good protein, and I'll do a heavy session in the, in the PM. And then, you know, you take a day off, or you take maybe you just do legs the next day, but then you come back, whether it's Thursday and Friday, this is something I think a lot of people lose track of. Is you got to do at least you got to be in the gym if you're going to be a good bencher. You got to be in there twice a week. For me, it ends up being three because I'm going heavy twice. That's just because I want to overkill it, and that's what I do um, as far as for my training. But I always come back, and you got to come back with a Thursday or Friday where you just do speed work. Speed work is to me, it's just about. It's force, it's the creation of forced muscle memory. It's, it's training your muscles in the shortest amount of time to duplicate perfect form or form that's going to help you on the, um, on the platform. And a lot of people have, they, a lot of people do this. It just transitions and it's called different things. But if you just take the principle for what it is and don't get so caught up in the technicalities, you see it everywhere. People just don't always recognize it because it's called different things. A basketball player, where they're going to go in the gym, they're going to have a shoot around. They're, you hear it all the time. They're going to take 100 to 200, 300 foul shots. They're going to take maybe 100 to 200 jump shots. It's the same thing. They're recreating and trying to duplicate something, and they're trying to perfect the form. So when it comes time for them to hit the, the shot in the game, it's automatic. They don't have to think about it. It's just automatic. It becomes instinctual. Same thing with a golfer. They're going to go and they're going to take a million putts. Same thing with a batter. That's why baseball, you see them take hour, two-hour pregame. They're in the batting cages. 
you're trying to duplicate something so when the time comes you're able to just not think about it and you're just able to perform with me I call it go time so if I go in and I want to train with something it's not about the weight it's about being able to train and create muscle memory create a groove if I do it 50 times it becomes so instinctual when I have to do it once it just happens without me even thinking about it so when I get to the platform of the competition I hear you know take I take my lift off you hear lift rack it just bec it all becomes automatic the commands become automatic you're not thinking about how much weight it is you're not thinking about how long you're holding it it's all stuff that you've trained to become automatic for you so that's kind of the point with speed and a lot of times with speed you can see right away and you can feel if your groove is off if you're not keeping your elbows tight the speed work you're going to feel that and you're going to see it because you're because when you do it, no matter how fast you're doing it, the form should be there. So while you're watching yourself, and this is why I think camera footage is great, if you're watching yourself do something 50 times, it, you're gonna see right away how, how far out are your elbows coming, how tight are your elbows coming. You know, do you, and part of what makes it easier is that you find that groove. If you're doing something that's awkward and you're not in your groove, if you're not in that stroke of power, your muscles are gonna feel it. You're gonna get fatigued, you're gonna get burnt out. So that's why, You'll see a lot of the speed work we do, we'll do four or five sets of 50. And it's after we finish because you took your muscles from being able to do something, you know, five, six, seven, ten times for a lot of strength. But were your muscles developing bad habits while you're doing that session, while you're doing those sets? And something the speed helps get you back to is just getting, getting your muscles back to the groove. Making sure that through the whole process, it's kind of like, I say, it's kind of like a race car. Whether you're in first gear or fifth gear, you want to be able to fire, fire as fast as possible through the whole movement, through the whole duration of whatever you're trying to do. So that's where speed comes into play. So you're so sometimes you gear your muscles down to get it used to be able to do something. So the speed, the speed brings it back up. So your muscles are fatigued, but now when you take on fatigue and you do speed, if you have, you have two choices when your muscles are fatigued, you can do maybe one or two more movements and pick up bad habits, or you can do one or two more movements with speed and learn how to do it the right way. So I just incorporate the speed, so I just train my muscles to have really good habits. Um, so that's kind of that. So I guess what we can get into next is just kind of just basic, fundamental um, hand placement, stuff on the bar. Uh, stuff that works for me, everybody's different. You'll see some people arch. Some people, some people are perfect archers. There's guys that are, you know, 308s or super heavyweights that get this perfect arch, and it helps them. To me, I'm not an archer. I don't wear a belt. Uh, it, it gets this kind of to each their own. So I'm not an archer, so I can't teach you how to do an arch, nor do I advocate it. There's a lot of stuff you can do with foot placement. Um, there's different theories on hand placement. We'll kind of Hmm. Okay, we start Bank here. Side? Riding through the hood in a hot bar. Right. And that is it in the swat had a trap house. Trap. Every day cuts through the set crack rock. Turn I it. got a pistol in my pocket and a bang roll. Hey. Anybody try me, I'ma let the thing go bust. It. I put a whole clip through you can't go, cause I'm your home and all like your buddy can't do nothing. Respect that. Respect you violated a mandatory nigga, bet that. What? Walk up a lot of Smith and West push a real bad, not an undercover ass people look at you dead. Can't with the OG. OZ slang, okay. style phone, double cup, codeine drinking. Later, run up on the wrong 44B, banging me, chat the car roll, what they gon' be saying out of.